The next area that we're going to go over is what is called inchoate crimes. I want you to know that there are three inchoate crimes, and those are solicitation, attempt, and conspiracy. Uh, most bar reviews know them by SAC. S-A-C is the acronym that they use. S for solicitation, A for attempt, and C for conspiracy. I want you to know that all solicitation, attempt, and conspiracy, all three SAC crimes are specific intent crimes. So meaning that the defendant must have the specific intent that the crime actually be committed. Okay, I want to go over the definition of inchoate for you. And this is a definition I took right out of the Black's Law Dictionary. In inchoate says that it is imperfect, impartial, and unfinished. Begun but not yet completed. So that's what inchoate is. It means an in not completed, okay? Or just the beginning of. So solicitation, again, solicitation is a specific intent crime and the definition is, it's when a defendant has the intent to solicit, entice, or induce another to commit a crime. The crime of solicitation is complete at the time of the solicitation. Once again, the definition of solicitation is when a defendant has the intent to solicit, entice, or induce another to commit a crime, the crime is complete at the time of the solicitation. I want you to know that once the target offense is committed, then solicitation will merge with that target offense. So let's say you have a multi-state where the defendant goes and says, let's say we have defendant A and B. A comes to B and says, I want you to murder my wife for me. A just solicited B to murder, okay? Let's say B says, no, I don't want to do that. And the question asks you, what is A guilty of? Conspiracy to commit murder, attempted conspiracy to commit murder, solicitation or solicitation and conspiracy. The only thing that A is going to be guilty of is the solicitation. That is it. Because we did not have B agree, so therefore there was no um, conspiracy, okay? So we have to be very, very consciously aware of what the call of the question is asking us for and what the actual defendants can be found guilty of. So another example, let's say uh, A goes to B and says to him, I want you to murder my wife for me. B says, okay, how much are you gonna pay me? And B says, I'm going to pay you $5,000. B says, okay, gives him the $5,000, he goes and murders his wife. Then he comes back and um, he gets caught ki killing the wife and the question asks you what is A guilty of? And it says number one, A would be solicitation, number two is murder solicitation and um, conspiracy, and number three says um, none of the above. What is he guilty of? The truth is he's only guilty of conspiracy and the murder charge because the solicitation, once the murder took place, merged with the actual crime, okay? So you gotta get that. Merger is very important on the bar exam and you're gonna see lots of questions on that as you go through multiple choice questions with your full service bar review. The next area of law that we're gonna go over is attempt. Now remember, anytime you have an attempt, it you have to have the specific intent that the crime be committed. So let's go over the definition of attempt. So it's when a defendant acts to commit a crime but is unable to complete the target offense. That's it. So again, attempt. It's when a defendant attempts to commit a crime but is unable to complete the target offense. So we have to have two elements for attempt and those two elements are they must have the specific intent that the crime be committed and number two, they must take a substantial step in furtherance of the crime. Mere preparation is not enough, okay? Again, they must have two elements for an attempt. Number one, the specific intent that the crime be committed and number two, they must take a substantial step in furtherance of a crime. Mere preparation is not enough. Just remember that. So for example, for murder, lying in wait, waiting for someone to come out to murder them, that would be a substantial step. Solicitation to commit the murder would be a substantial step. The unlawful entering of a structure where uh, the crime is going to occur would be a substantial step. And also possessing materials 
to use in the crime would also be considered a substantial step. Those are all substantial steps. I want to discuss with you withdrawal as a defense to attempt. And I want you to know under the common law and under the majority and what you want to follow on the MBE, because there's a split of jurisdictions, says that there will be no effect on an attempted withdrawal once the defendant is within the zone or act of the crime, okay? So once he's in the act of the crime or in the zone of perpetration, there is no effective withdrawal available to him, okay? Under the model penal code, I want you to know that yes, a withdrawal can be effective if it is voluntary and successful. So we have to find two elements. Number one, the defendant must inform all of the parties of his intent to withdraw. And number two, he must thwart the target offense by informing the police. Let me say that again. If they ask you on the MBE to, um, about the crime of attempt, and specifically withdraw from an attempted crime, if they ask you for the model penal code answer, the answer is yes, it can be effective if the defendant completes two things. Number one, he must inform all of the other parties of his intent to withdraw, and number two, he must thwart the target offense by informing the police. At common law, I want you to know that legal impossibility was a defense for attempt, and I'm gonna go over that. And then we also have a common law factual impossibility, which was no defense to attempt. So let's go over legal impossibility as a defense to attempt. Legal impossibility, the definition is, even if the defendant does what he intended to do, but the act does not constitute a crime, then it is legally impossible to commit the crime, meaning the act is not illegal. Once again, legal impossibility. Definition is, even if the defendant does what he intended to do, but the act does not constitute a crime, then it is a legal impossibility to commit the crime, meaning the act isn't illegal. So how can we find him guilty of a crime? It's legally impossible for him to be uh, guilty of that crime. So for example, I remember one multi-state question where there's a guy who um, is part of a fraternity and he's gonna go out flashing girls. But when he flashes, and he's flashing with his boxers on, and he thinks it's illegal to do that. However, it's not illegal to do that. So he, he gets arrested, and they charge him with flashing. But he's not going to be found guilty because actual flashing your boxers is not illegal. So he can't be found guilty because it's legally impossible. It is not illegal to flash people with boxers on. So that's what legal impossibility is. It just means that the act that the defendant is committing, regardless of whether he thinks that it's illegal or not, is not illegal, okay?